Oh, hey, look at that. There we are. A bit, we're back again. You can't back get again. rid of us. Yes. Carl, Where are we this week? Uh, we are in in your heart, in your mind, and all over the world. Calling Chris Anderson in London. This is Chris Anderson in London, and calling Rick Byer in Chicago. Glad to be here, Chris. Happy Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes. Happy holidays. No war on Christmas here, but no, no. Hopefully, you know, Santa brings you a big bag full of books. Uh, you know, there's always that hope, and uh, because Lord knows, I. Don't have enough. I don't have enough <laughs> books to read as it is, you know, because Santa's bringing those books every day of the year, it seems like. Yes. Welcome, everybody, to History Happy Hour this Christmas Day, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, which offers a variety of history tours in Europe, the U.S., and the Pacific, all of which, no, some of which are led by Chris Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you can check it out. He feels sometimes like it's he feels awesome. Feels like You can check it out at stephenambrosetours.com. Uh, and hey, whether you're listening live, whether you're listening, watching live, listening to the podcast, watching on replay, as long as you're here. Unwrapping presents, watching it. Yeah, we, uh, that's a great idea. A little eggnog, unwrap a present, and watch a history happy hour. See. In any case, we're glad you're here and uh, joining us today for uh, an encore episode uh, with, uh, where we're going to talk about the day the Irish invaded Canada, which was you know, not a good day for either side, I think. Um, but let us know what you're drinking, and I hope eggnog is is part of that, Chris. Don't you? What? Yeah. Yes. Uh, where's your eggnog? My eggnog is is downstairs being. being I know egged it's being egg egg nog. Being right. egged nog. I, I I I'm eggnogless right now. Yeah, I'm drinkless so. at the moment. Oh, so you so you just thought you'd call me out? Even I though did. You I did prepared. exactly. Oh, okay. I'm yeah, projecting. Yeah. I'm projecting okay. my okay, failings you. onto you. Okay, good. Is I'll, that, go you I'll go to the pub when this is over. Then. Thank are you happy now? Uh, we also want to thank all the people who support us via Patreon, Chris. Absolutely. We, we have plenty of room on there for other uh -huh. people. But these are our top shelf sponsors. We have other patrons as well. And, and uh, I, I, hope, I hope they're all wearing their hats now. And many of them, at least 16, I think, hats that all I've right, sent right, out uh, so right. far. So they're appearing out there in the world. Do send us or post on our Facebook page a picture of you and your Live happy action happy history hour happens. Hat, or a yeah. video of you in your history happy hour hat mm. and you can get a hat by becoming a top shelf patron at patreon.com slash history happy hour uh well everybody I, I i hope we've 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 built up a big enough audience by now or not it's christmas so perhaps uh you know it'll come later but chris give us a drum roll why don't we get this puppy on the road <laughs> is open the bar is open and chris i'm gonna start out i'm gonna make it all about me to of begin course. with as that, i warned you i might par for the course yeah yes yeah. absolutely uh 17 years ago i wrote a book called the greatest war stories never told wait wait wait, wait. you wrote a book other than that book that we're not going to talk about yeah i've written a book oh okay a few of them right wow. and this is, this is it's still available on amazon.com <laughs> And, and wherever books are sold. Uh, the Greatest War Stories Never Told. Here it is. And I, I have a copy there so you can see what it looks oh. like. One of those stories starts off like this. They came across the border on the night of June 1, 1866, an army of Irish-American nationalists, Fenians as they called themselves, ready to fight and die for Ireland and British rule. So what the heck were they doing in Canada? Wait a minute. They were... Going to fight and die for Ireland and British rule? No, for Ireland to free Ireland from British rule. Well, you didn't rule. say that. Oh, okay. Just want to be clear. Yes. Misspoke. So what the heck were they doing in I Canada? would like to know. Yeah, and that's going to be my first question for our guest today, who is Christopher Klein, and he is the author of the book, When the Irish Invaded Canada, the incredible, true story of the Civil War veterans who fought for Ireland's freedom. And uh, Chris is the author of several books and many articles. He's a prolific history writer, and he joins us here today from his fake library. In, oh, no, it's his real oh, his, library. Yeah, we just have library envy. Very real library in Andover, Massachusetts. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing great working, Chris. Good. Did, Thanks for joining us. Did you bring a cocktail? I did. So I, I don't have an Irish pub in, in the library here, so uh, you can't have a properly poured Guinness. Um, 
could not find the harp I wanted to get. I do have a harp mug where I've got a, a nice amber lager uh, called Red Tape from the Jack's Abbey Brewery here. Good enough. We, we had a guest on a couple of weeks ago who, whose library used to be a pub. So, mm -hmm. you know, there that's... There you go. Chris, do you... Well, why did they take it out? Oh, exactly. <laughs> Very right. good. Why, why fill it up with books? <laughs> Chris, do you have a, a drink there? I do. I have a very proper British gin and tonic. Yes, and story. I have a, an anti-hero IPA because I think there's a lot of anti-heroes in this story. <laughs> Plus, it's all green, which seems to be a color. Uh, Christopher Klein, uh, I repeat my question to you. These people are trying to fight for the freedom of Ireland. What are they doing in Canada? What is going on? Give us a kind of an overview of the story. Lots and lots of shenanigans. That's, that's what they're up to. So. <laughs> They bought the wrong map. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, Ireland, you know, the luck of the Irish wasn't really something you wanted to have for about 700 years of, of history, particularly uh, when it comes to the relations with the British. So Ireland's a colony of uh, Great Britain for a good 700 years, including during the 1800s and 1860s when the story is uh, uh, about and uh, you, you probably are aware about the great hunger that occurs in between 1845 and 1852 where you have uh, a million Irish who die, two million who flee the country and a lot of them come to the United States and they never let go of the idea of staging a revolution in Ireland to get rid of British rule. So in 1858 there's this group called the Fenian Brotherhood that forms here in the United States that works with a sister organization called the Irish Republican Brotherhood in Ireland. And their whole goal is to have a revolution inside Ireland. And years go by, the Civil War happens, the British sort of crack down on the IRB in Britain. And at the end of the Civil War, a lot of the Fenians are thinking, well, why, why are we gonna try to do this revolution in Ireland? We don't have a single boat, let alone a Navy. <laughs> So let's hit the British where it's easiest to hit them. And that's right in America's backyard up in Canada, because Canada is also a colony of the British um, at the time of the end of the Civil War as well. So this group of Fenians sort of breaks away from the original plan of having this, this revolution in Ireland, decides that their best course of action is going to be to attack the British uh, in the colony of Canada. Yeah, so, so that makes lots of sense, <laughs> sort of. So, Chris, just backing up a bit, you know, one of the great American foundation myths is people come to America, uh, they immigrate, they come to America, they settle in, they become Americans, and time marches on, and, and that's great. Um, but these uh, these Irish that settle after the famine, there's almost two stories going on here. Yes, some of them are settling and becoming Americans, but there's also this they're keeping this identity alive and uh, kind of how does that come about and what's happening to them during the civil war how does that sort of play into this yeah so i mean it's a very key part of, of the story here so the irish who are coming to the united states really in great numbers occurs after the failure of the potato crop in 1845 so you have more than a million of a million irish who in the next decade are coming into the country and they're unlike any newcomers that the United States had seen before. You know, very basically, they're not necessarily hungering for American ideals. They're literally starving for food. So they're different in that respect. About a quarter of them don't speak the English language. They only speak Irish. Uh, but what really sets them apart is that to many Americans, the Irish who are arriving are most of them are practicing a alien religion to them, which is Catholicism. Ah, they're papists. You, know, you, have, you have this country that the United States really founded on, you know, Protestant principles going back to the arrival of the, you know, pilgrims and, and, and Puritans. And now you have by tens of thousands into some of the cities along the East Coast, these, you know, you have Irish who are, some of them not speaking the language, practicing this strange religion. And they do not assimilate very easily into American culture. And for 700 years, the British had been talking about the Irish problem. Well, the, the Irish problem to the British was that they weren't, they were Irish. They, weren't. <laughs> they were living there, <laughs> yes. So they're trying to assimilate them by taking away their religion, their language, their culture, and they fail to do so. 
So when the Irish come to the United States and sort of face that same discrimination, they react in very much the same way. And that is to sort of coil inward for protection, like, like a snake. And so they'll band together in um, church parishes, fraternal organizations like the Ancient Order of Hibernians. And then after the founding of the Fenian Brotherhood in 1858, they're going to start joining that organization as well. So it's sort of those experiences that they had under British rule that they're taking with them to the United States when they start experiencing that same discrimination. And then when the Civil War starts, you know, to, to some of these Irish, it was a way for them to sort of prove their patriotism to, mm. to the country. But really, for most of them, it was a paycheck. You know, they were at the bottom rung of the economic ladder. Um, there's an Irish scholar named Damien Shields who has done some remarkable research in terms of the numbers of native-born Irish who fought in the Civil War. And I was blown away when, according to his research, about 200,000 native-born Irish fight in the native Civil born, War. Native-born, not native second generation. Born. Right. Wow. So, and most of them, 100, about 175,000 are on the Union side, 25,000 on the Confederacy. And really, who they were fighting for, it just a matter of where they settled for. You know, they're not necessarily, they're not enlisting, you know, to free slaves. That's not what they're getting into. They really are getting into it for a paycheck. But to really these diehard members of the Fenian Brotherhood, they really see themselves still as Irish first, American second, no matter how many years they spent in the country. And they see the Civil War as a training ground that they can learn battlefield tactics, or learn weaponry that they can then use to stage this uh, battle they really want to fight, which is to cast off the British back in Ireland. So one of the things that I thought was interesting, because we want to kind of work on this context before we get to the actual uh, incursion, invasion, delusion, invasion. whatever invasion. you want to call it. Um, uh, but I found interesting two things. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong or elucidate, you know, add, enlighten further. Uh, but, but one is that um, uh, m many of the, these uh, Irish in America who want to fight for Ireland, they're not all Roman Catholic. I mean, because that was my first assumption was this is all, you know, Roman Catholic Irish. Uh, uh, my, you know, my family uh, descends from Roman Catholic Irish. But you've got Roman Catholic and Protestant. And the other thing is that the Catholic Church in the United States is not exactly, you know, pro Fenian uh, Brotherhood uh, and their goals, are they? Not at all. Not at all. Um, to the Roman Catholic Church, initially when the Fenian Brotherhood forms it is formed as a secret oath-based society and that is not uh, permissible under the rules of the catholic church so it's because of this this reason that they that the fenians are the secret society that they that members uh, eventually by 1871 the pope decrees that members would be excommunicated from the church which will be very ironic because maybe we'll see as we talk further the thing that the fenians could do uh, that they were at least good at was keeping a secret. Keeping a secret, right? <laughs> Not doing it. Use, use the Irish gift of gab very, very freely. Um, but playing. And we should say, we should say, by the way, Chris, that just in case anyone thinks you're, you're dumping on people of Irish descent, that you yourself are uh, largely yes. of Irish descent. Yes, Lar yes. Got that it's shortened Irish from Oakline. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just don't look at my, at me or my name, and just we'll we'll go with that. So, <laughs> um, but when it comes to the religion side of things, so it really is what's going on in Ireland during this time of the Great Hunger. There's this there is this attempt at a revolution in 1848 where you have a lot of Republican revolutions across Europe. Same impulse hits Ireland, and the rebellion that's launched there is by a, a movement, a group called Young Ireland very much a secular based revolution so you have uh the leaders there are both protestants and catholics and the catholic church does not support the revolution um in, in ireland either uh, you know they are actually kind of entrenched in where they are in society they don't want this upending necessarily of the social order in ireland so the catholic church was never uh backing any of these rebellions in ireland and when they come to America, many of the same leaders, you have to understand many of the, the, the bishops in the United States at that time also were, you know, born in Ireland and, and uh, emigrate from Ireland to America. So 
um, they, they sort of have these same experiences that, that they're bringing at that same time. So, so because one of the things that really struck me as I'm reading the book was, you know, I had some vague awareness of what had happened, but what really struck me was the level of organization. I mean, this isn't, you know, a couple dozen guys that have a few too many in a pub one night and say, let's go across the border. This is a well-organized, well-funded, arguably well-led, but there's structure to this. So can, oh, yeah. can you talk a little bit about kind of the organization and how, what do they create? I mean, this is a big operation. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's sort of one of the myths because, I mean, part of what happens here is we're viewing this through the lens of today where the United States and Canada share the longest, you know, in a peaceful international boundary in the world. And part of what I try to do in the book is try to take everyone back 150 years to see that the idea is not nearly as crazy as we as it sounds today. Um, but so this isn't, you know, a couple guys in a bar in Buffalo scribbling down a plan on, on a napkin and then and then tearing it out as it sometimes gets to be cast. The Fenian Brotherhood um, really has a vast network in the months after the Civil War. So even during the Civil War, they will send recruiters out to different Union Army camps to try to recruit members and uh, they actually will stage their first national convention in 1863, and any of the members actually got passes to leave the front lines to go to this convention. In the months after the Civil War, there's these Fenian recruiters who would go on these whistle stop tours around the uh, mining camps in Appalachia or the mill cities in New England, and they would sign up um, hundreds of members, you know, city after city that, that they go to. And at the same time, they're raising money. So they're selling, um, they're selling war bonds, the nominations from $10 to $500. And you would buy your war bonds. They would be payable to you uh, after the establishment of the Irish Republic with 6% interest. Sort of an interesting side note is, to this is that when the Irish Republic is eventually uh, established decades and decades later, all of a sudden, these war bonds come out of people's drawers over in America, <laughs> looking to trade off in Dublin. And they have no idea what you know what, what these things are. Uh, but you know, they, they, you probably get your six percent interest on eBay these days. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Is, yeah. it, is it payable in Bitcoin though? That, it may be, maybe. Maybe we'll have to see. But they would take this money and they're buying you know surplus weapons uh, at the end of the Civil War. You know, you have Fenian members who served in the in the army who bought their own weapons, but then they're also going to these arsenals and, and they're buying a lot of the weapons that they're trying to stockpile for the revolution. And by 1866, they actually have, the Fenian Brotherhood has its own president, has its own constitution, has its own Capitol building right in the heart of Manhattan. It's a brownstone on the north side of Union Square right. called the Moffat Mansion. And inside this, uh, inside this brownstone you can see freely operating right out in the public this isn't that secret organization <laughs> that catholic, catholics have banned you have the stars and stripes you have this green flag with an irish harp on it and it's inside these walls that they're plotting uh plotting their invasions and i well, let's talk about the um uh, the invasion plan, because I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, their 1866 plan is pretty audacious. It's a, uh, it's a, this is Eisenhower level invasion strategy. Maybe not, not in its brilliance. Yeah, it's but like I, mean, that. I mean, it's probably scope. a dangerous comparison there. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have a visual here uh, that I borrowed from the net, and it actually comes from Peter Vronsky's book, Ridgeway, the American Fenian Invasion in the 1866 Battle that Made Canada. Uh, and it, this, this is, it's a three-prong attack. Is that, that's right, uh, Chris? So it's actually, you know, they're plan, planning like for a five-prong attack here from um, multiple locations. So I think it's important to talk about maybe first just the brainchild of, of this invasion plan, who's uh, Thomas William Sweeney. Uh, to me, he's sort of the epitome of the fighting Irish. He, uh, he had emigrated from Ireland when he was a young boy uh, in the 1820s, I think. Got swept overboard in a storm in the Atlantic and managed to survive a half hour before he was finally rescued. Mm. Joins the Union Army, fights in the Mexican-American War, 
takes a gunshot to the groin, keeps on fighting. A couple of minutes later, takes one to his right arm, requires it to be amputated, but he remains in the Union Army. Um, we'll fight at the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, we'll get into a fist fight with a superior officer and whip him with his one good arm. So what's remarkable to me about Sweeney is that, so after being in the United States for decades, giving his right arm to the United States, he leaves the Union Army after the Civil War to come up with the battle plan, and he serves as the Secretary of War for the Fenian Brotherhood. So the plan that, that Sweeney develops is, is sort of akin to the one that was tried unsuccessfully uh, in the War of 1812. Uh, but we pop that, back, that map back up there. So he's plotting sort of this amphibious invasion. So he's going to have boats that are leaving from Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and Buffalo. And then he's going to have these forces all sort of converge and march on Toronto. And his, his plan is that this is all a feint. And what he's trying to do then is to draw uh, the British defense and Canadian defense forces away from his true target, and that's going to be Montreal. And his plan is to send an army of about 17,000 men straight up through the Lake Champlain Valley, seize Montreal, seize Quebec City, and then he'll have in control the St. Lawrence River, which is really the lifeblood of Canadian uh, commerce. So in essence, they can use that to, to sort of gain a foothold, sort of hold Canada hostage, that they can ransom it eventually for Ireland's independence. Sort of baked into this plan is that he expects that he's going to get the support of all the Irish who had emigrated or immigrated into Canada, he suspects that all of them are going to want to cast off British rule as well. Include and in addition to that, those French-speaking uh, Canadians living in Quebec, who he suspects are going to the minute that the Fenians set foot in Canada, he expects that they're going to join his this forces. Is, they'll, they'll greet us as liberators. <laughs> they'll greet us as liberators. It, it's sort of that the. the the taking of Canada will be a mere matter of marching, as Thomas Jefferson had predicted mm. for the War of 1812. So, uh, sort of, a, you know, for for all that uh, military training, he's sort of going to try to repeat that, that battle plan of 1812 that did not work very well. And so, that's why Canada's part of Ireland today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things I think that is important to, I guess, point out, because the story is so bizarre that sometimes it almost becomes comical in your mind, but these were experienced soldiers. I mean, the, the Sweden is not unaware of what is involved in combat. And a lot of these people had had experience, but, but one of the things that I, I, I was curious about, I'd like you to maybe elaborate a little bit on, he's talking about thousands of Fenians marching across the border into Canada. Um, and obviously we'll get into the numbers as we go on, but, what does he expect that the American government is going to think when armed military bodies are marching uh, over the border? Yeah. So, I mean, that's a real interesting aspect of this story. And, and probably one of the most surprising ones is that this is this idea I found in doing the research. This idea seems like it really has the tacit support of the White House. Mm -hmm. And that just goes to speak of the tremendous animosity that existed at the end of the Civil War towards both the British and and to Canada as well. So on the British side, the you know the, the British Declaration of Neutrality was not viewed very well by the Union uh, side. And during the Civil War, you have Confederate warships that are being built in British ports that set sail and and ravage Union shipping. So the uh, uh, ship such as the CSS Alabama, which was built, I believe, in, in Liverpool, and then, according to some accounts, was manned not just with Confederates, but also with uh, some British crews who were able to fake some Southern accents, according to at least to, to some accounts. But the Alabama would go around the globe just uh, seizing Union shipping. So at the end of the war, uh, Andrew Johnson wants millions of dollars of reparations to be paid by the British government under what we'll call the Alabama claims. And then the views of Canada in, in the United States aren't too great either because you have 
uh, sell the Canadian Secret Service that's in operation, uh, excuse me, a sell the Confederate Secret Service in operation in Canada that is involved in uh, raids on a bank in St. Albans, Vermont, and that's tens of thousands of dollars. They plot this firebombing of theaters and public spaces in New York City in November of 1864, which they, they carry out but, but does not go as they planned. And then there were these reports uh, after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln that supposedly John Wilkes Booth was seen walking the streets of Montreal days before uh, he showed up at Ford's Theater and that when he was killed, there was a note from the Royal Ontario Bank in his pocket. So all this is combining also at the same time that Manifest Destiny is alive. I was going to say, I think we need to add that we have this assumption that the Canadians are just going to want to be us one of these days. Exactly. I wouldn't say. (laughs) So there's actually a bill that's introduced in the Congress, 1865, that already plots out where the 29 new congressmen are going to come from the four new Canadian states. And there's a senator named Zach Chandler of Michigan at the end of the war who thinks that as a way to really reunite the country is to put together an army of 200,000 men with 100,000 from the north and 100,000 from the south. And what they're going to do is they're going to go and invade Canada and they're going to stay there until the British pay the Alabama claims. Mm. So in come the income, the immigrants into Andrew Johnson's office with pretty much sort of the same, the same idea, plan, right? Yeah. Essentially. So, you know, why not outsource it? Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but there's, there's a meeting that occurs at the White House between leaders of the Fenian Brotherhood and Andrew Johnson and Secretary of State William Seward. And it, according to the Fenian account, it's the only one we have. So, you know, yeah, certainly have to take that into account. They sort of float this idea of, you know, what would you think if someday you woke up and there was a Fenian army in Canada? And according to the Fenians, uh, you know, Johnson said that he would, quote, acknowledge accomplished facts, which they took to mean that he's not going to actively support them in what would be a violation of American neutrality laws, but he's not going to do anything to stop them either. So, you know, if he wakes one day and they're in Canada, they're in Canada. You know, maybe we'll deal with it then. So obviously, if you're planning a major invasion of another country, secrecy, security are very, very important. There's a great quote that you have in your book on this topic from Mark Twain. No news travels so freely (laughs) or fast as the secret doings of the Fenian Brotherhood. In solemn whispering at dead of night, they secretly plan a Canadian raid and publish it in the world the next morning. So, um, so they're making plans here, but um, <clears throat> the the folks in Canada are not just blissfully going on around about their business, unaware of this these machinations. Not hardly, are they? Not at all. So, I mean, you actually have spies from three countries that have infiltrated the Fenians. You know, you have. <laughs> British Secret Service. Americans got spies in there. The you know Canada's keeping tabs on. Were there any there. actual Fenians who there were? There were. There were, there were okay, just, some okay. that, that, that were in there. Um, so yeah, so so they're very well being surveilled, and for months, you know, when this invasion finally comes in June 1866, there had been you know rumors for months that uh, an invasion was going to happen. In fact. Canadians thought it was going to happen on St. Patrick's Day in 1866. So they actually they canceled the parades in the big cities. They called out the, their militia, sent them all to the border, and then nothing happened. So there was just a lot of skepticism in the months after that that this was actually ever going to happen. They just thought that there was just a lot of bluster about an invasion. So um, – when it actually happens in June 1866, there, there are no Canadian defense forces within miles of, of the border because they were afraid of calling out the militia again. Um, they got such blowback from doing it the, the first time. The attitude was sort of like, well, you know, it's just let's wait to see that this thing actually is going to happen because we, we just don't necessarily believe that it is. Uh, but it actually of all the talk that's going on. But it actually does happen. So let's talk a little bit about how this all plays out. I mean, what what size force actually crosses the border what happens right and so, it's not in all three of those you know five of those spots and all those landing craft going up Lake michigan yeah no, we don't get the seventeen thousand man army either uh, so 
so Sweeney's plans put into action in late May of 1866, and you have regiments that are traveling as far as New Orleans uh, who get the telegram, start heading north on the railroads. And, you know, it's also not easy to conceal, you know, a, a group of like 100 Irishmen, right. uh, you know, bring, you know, uni- some of them dressed in their Union blues and Confederate grays uh, in the age of the telegraph. So, I mean, that, that is sort of difficult to move uh, troops from you know, over hundreds of uh, miles to the, to the war scene. So, uh, but Sweeney's plan starts to fall apart really even before it begins. So you, you they can't find the boats in Chicago. They can't find the commanders in, you know, Detroit and, and Cleveland. Uh, you, you get some hundreds that do show up from Louisville and Nashville and, and New Orleans show up in Cleveland. Um, and there just aren't a lot of Fenians on board because I think not only were the Canadians and the Americans maybe skeptical that it's going to happen, I think a lot of the Fenians themselves were as well. I mean, we've been yeah. hearing about this for months and months. And I think the attitude was, let's, something happens and then, then we'll, you know. We're right behind you. Well, then we'll head to the war front. Uh, so... Sweeney finds out, you know, he's got a few hundred men in Buffalo. He's got a few hundred men in Cleveland. He decides, all right, we're just going to send everyone to Buffalo. We're going to get into Canada. And then once we're in Canada, we're going to get those thousands and thousands of Fenians uh, coming behind uh, from the United States, which actually does happen. And then, of course, he also expects once we're in Canadian territory, we're going to get the support of all those um, in Canada as well, because he's planning not only this, attack from Buffalo into Ontario, he's still got that main force he's expecting to go from uh, Vermont into southern Quebec, where he expects that once he gets closer to Montreal, he's going to start getting that support of the, the, the Francophones up in Canada. Okay. So, um, so what happens? I mean, this is, uh, this is, this is kind of the, uh, there, there's some other stuff we should say that's already gone on, uh, uh, elsewhere, but this is kind of the main thrust, uh, and he, uh, I think it's, is it June, June 2nd? Uh, so, uh, early morning, June, early morning, June 1st, 1866, so actually probably late in the night of May 31st, all of a sudden you've got these reports of hundreds of uh, Irishmen with wagons behind them um, going through the streets of Buffalo, New York. And the Fenians know there's only one thing that's standing between them and Canadian territory, and that is an American warship, the USS Michigan, that is docked in Buffalo. And uh, so when the reports come that there's, you know, this Irish army marching through Buffalo, the captain of the boat, Andrew Bryson, gives the order for his pilot to get out into the Niagara River to stop them from crossing. But unbeknownst to Andrew Bryson, that there is a Fenian sleeper cell, about 17 of his sailors are actually members of the Fenian Brotherhood, and they know that that boat is not going anywhere without their pilot, whose name is Patrick Murphy. But the name should not fool, fool you. Patrick Murphy was a loyal sailor, both in the British Navy and the American Navy. He's going to follow any order he's given, and the Fenians know that. So they know the only way that they're going to be able to sabotage the USS Michigan is to take uh, Patrick Murphy out. And I don't mean take him out with a gun. They take him out for a night on the town of Buffalo. <laughs> so when Andrew Bryson's giving his order for the the Michigan to go out to Niagara River, supposedly Patrick Murphy is seen arm in arm with a woman singing the wearing of the green down the streets of Buffalo. <laughs> and the coast is now clear for the 800 uh, Fenians who chartered a couple of barges. Uh, they set sail across the Niagara River and they plant their Irish flags right into British soil. Um, and I think the other important thing to, to note here is that you, this is a ragtag army. You've got men in Union uh, blues and Confederate grays, some in civilian clothing. You have some who fought in the Civil War. Many of them did fight in the Civil War, but you also had others who didn't. Uh, but they are led by a man named John O'Neill, uh, who was the head of the Fenian Circle in, uh, in, in Nashville. And he was the highest ranking man at that time. So he was the one who was given uh, the charge of this Irish army as it went into Canada. And he had been raised in Ireland as a young boy. He learned tales of the O'Neill clan, famous members like 
you O'Neill and Owen Rowe O'Neill who are famous not because they defeated the British but because they they launched revolutions against them and then O'Neill lived through the great hunger and saw a, a quarter of the people in his surrounding area die uh, under British rule so you know he very much radicalized you know if we were going to use today's parlance by his own experiences and also sort of carrying this family legacy knowing that you know it it maybe the odds are tremendously against you but the odds have been against the irish for hundreds of years and the way to become known and revered in irish history wasn't necessarily to be the ones to cast off the bridge but at least be the ones who chose to fight against them so but but moving on so they're they're in canada and then there's there's a little bit of an excellent there's a battle right yeah yeah so, so how, how does this all play out and so uh, O'Neill's forces go about 24 hours without coming across any of uh, the Canadian defense forces. And once the reports finally come in that, hey, you know, this invasion actually has happened, uh, there are the Canadian defense forces are sort of a ragtag bunch. You have, you know, farmers who never fired a gun in their lives. You have a regiment that was uh, actually composed of professors and students from the University of Toronto uh, who got a knock on their door as they were studying for finals saying, hey, good news, you don't have to study for your finals anymore. But the bad news is we need you at the drill shed in downtown Toronto at 3 a.m. where we're going to give you a gun and you're going to go out and fight against the southern invaders. Watch out, Chris, that this doesn't happen to anyone in your family. I was going to say, my daughter goes to the University of Toronto. Okay. So. <laughs> If she so, calls to tell you that exams are canceled, that's when yeah. you start worrying. Do not, do not show up at that drill shed. Yeah. Day. So it's this Canadian Defense Force that meets up with O'Neill's forces about 20 miles south of Niagara Falls, outside a village called Ridgeway. And John O'Neill is on this high ground, this limestone ridge, and he can see that he's got a much... Uh, much larger army that's heading his way, but O'Neill knows that he at least has the advantage of having men who have fought uh, before. Mm. And this battle will ensue outside uh, the village of Ridgeway and become known as the Battle of Ridgeway. And it's going to be uh, definitely the biggest engagement of these Fenian raids. Mm. And she mentioned not only this one that happened in 1866, there's going to be five incursions across the Canadian border that happens until 1871. but. The Battle of Ridgeway is definitely the most seminal moment there. And, um, Rick, I don't know if you want to throw up one of the... the one there, of these but, incredibly accurate yeah, illustrations exactly. of the battle? Exactly. So, slightly ahistorical, but this is the <laughs> one that, that, that enters the popular memory. A uh, couple differences here is that the, you don't have the British all in their red, uh, and, they're, and they're not the, you know, the regular red coast, as we think. The Irish are not behind uh, the, an IRA banner and dressed in, in their green uniforms. Uh, in this particular occasion, when they come back in 1870, they are going to be wearing them and they are going to call themselves the Irish Republican Army. Sort of the, 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 and there's a through line between that IRA and the IRA that we, that we know in modern times as well. And they're not fighting in these close quarters, reenacting the Battle of Lexington and Concord in, in some sort of field. Uh, they're in an apple orchard. Uh, and if we bring up that second illustration, uh, you will see these soldiers dressed in green. These are not the Fenians. These are the Canadian Defense Forces. Hey. So, uh, so as the battle starts uh, with their superior numbers, uh, and they do have some, uh, some uh, repeating rifles as well, the Canadians are able to start pressing the fight, but O'Neill is able to do some battlefield tactics uh, with his men uh, who have had that experience not long ago being in battle. So as the Canadians start pressing ahead, they get a little too far ahead of themselves. O'Neill orders all his men to retreat until uh, just the right moment where he appears on top of this limestone ridge on top of a horse and gives an order for his men to charge and it completely changes the whole tide of the battle. And at the same time, the inexperienced Canadian commanders see John O'Neill on a horse and think the cavalry charge is coming his way. So they defend themselves as expecting a cavalry charge, but the only horse is the one that John O'Neill has underneath him. <laughs> and 
basically the Canadian Defense Forces are, are become sitting ducks for the, the Fenians as they uh, launch their attack. And um, Canadians will end up, many of them just on the run, throwing their rifles down, fleeing for safety. And uh, John O'Neill's forces will emerge victorious at the Battle of Ridgeway. And it is a deadly battle, too. There's about 20, uh, 20 who will die on both sides. Uh, I believe there's five, actually, students from the University of Toronto who were killed in the battle uh, who will be immortalized, and I, they have a memorial to them yep. uh, on, on campus there. Uh, so, I mean, this is a very serious situation. I mean, you think about it in, in modern times, if you had an army crossed the border and you had young men who were dying, sort of what the reaction would be. And not surprising, it's going to be quite harsh from the Canadian perspective who they will end up capturing Fenians from that battle and they will put them um, on trial and, and put them on death row as well. It becomes a big mm. diplomatic uh, incident uh, between Canada, Great Britain and the United States after, afterwards. So what happens? So the the Fenians win uh, the Battle of Ridgeway there, but um, clearly they don't win the war. Um, uh, their victory, it, it, this is not happening in secret. I'm sure it's very well covered in all the newspapers. And their victory then sort of brings other Fenians in their direction from cities across the United States. So why aren't they able to capitalize on this to make more inroads? Right. So after the battle, you know, John O'Neill's wondering, you know, where are all the Fenians from the United States who are going to be crossing behind them? Where are the Fenians in Canada are going to be or the Irish in Canada are going to be coming out to support him? So he will double back to their landing spot uh, in Fort Erie, Ontario. And as the Fenians get back to Fort Erie, there's another running battle through the streets, more of a guerrilla battle that, that the, the Fenians will hold their own in. But when John O'Neill gets there, he sees what has happened is that the USS Michigan has finally gotten out into the Niagara River, uh, along with some other American ships that are now have cut off any of the supply lines. They're preventing any more passage from Buffalo into Ontario. So you actually have a lot of the Athenians uh, on the shorelines of Buffalo watching what's going on in Fort Erie with the, the gun battle over there from the opposite side, unable to cross over. So John O'Neill knows that without any reinforcements and without any sort of homegrown support in Canada, he's not going to be able to take the fight any further. So uh, he decides that what he's going to have to do is retreat back to Canada, or excuse me, retreat back to uh, the United States. Uh, before he does so, He's going to line up all the prisoners that, that, that the Fenians have taken uh, from the Canadian Defense Forces. And they're lined up one by one. They fully expect that, you know, certainly crossing their mind, they may be ready to face a firing squad here before John O'Neill leaves. Instead, John O'Neill goes down, shakes each man's hand one by one, tells him, or even his Douglas MacArthur best, that he's going to return sometime soon with a much larger <laughs> army and retreats back to the United States. But before he can get there, he is he and all the Fenians are put under arrest. And O'Neill and the officers will be put into a jail in Buffalo. Uh, the rank and file are put on this barge that's attached to the back of the USS Michigan. They basically are standing out of the elements for a day or two before Andrew Johnson, never the most decisive president in American history, decides that He's going to finally let them go. So they are all released. John O'Neill and his officers uh, will go into a courtroom. Uh, they are released on bail with the help of a local lawyer, lawyer from Buffalo by the name of Grover Cleveland, who, of course, will become the president of the United States. Uh, they are released on bail, and eventually the charges against them will be dropped uh, <laughs> by, the, by the American government. And there's no, uh, there's nothing political about any of this. Uh, right? Never, <laughs> no, no. never. Well, you know, one of the things that, I mean, again, all, all kidding aside, and, and what that I would like to talk about now is, here's an example, and you, you describe it wonderfully in the book, of an Irish armed force defeating a British armed force. So, 
You know, the, the green flag, they're, they're, they're capturing a British flag. What's the impact of that moment, not only on the Fenians there, but kind of like the, the larger Irish community, not only in the, in the United States, but even in Ireland? I mean, this must be kind of electrifying. Yeah, it's big news. I mean, certainly in, so John O'Neill will become known as the hero of Ridgeway. I mean, that, that just becomes his moniker, even though he will get himself into increasingly more farcical interactions, but this will still sort of be his, his crowning glory. And in a way it was correct that, you know, when this news travels through the United States, you do get thousands of Irish who then board the train, start heading for the Canadian border. And they will be lingering around Buffalo for close to a couple of weeks before the United States decides that um, we got to get these guys home. And the only way we're going to do is we're going to pay for their rail transportation back home. They send General George Meade up to, you know, a lot of these guys who had fought for him, too. You know, he's sent up to the border and he's going between New York and Vermont and trying to get these men back uh, and the thousands who have followed behind them. So it is this big moment. In the United States, Ireland, you know, the reception to the Fenians is a little bit interesting because um, this isn't necessarily a fight that they wanted to have. You know, they're, right. they're still trying to get over the whole great hunger. Um, you know, there is this idea of launching another revolution in Ireland and that will happen uh, and fizz out very quickly in 1867. But the Irish are kind of afraid of what the ramifications are going to be from British the British as well you know it's like well you guys are pressing that fight there we're just trying to live our lives and survive after the great hunger whereas the Irish in America you know sort of have that freedom and that that, that luxury of being able to worry about Irish freedom and not just their day-to-day -day subsistence so uh, so even though it is this great victory over the British you know it is sort of tempered a bit in Ireland. It's not nearly as uh, a, a boost as it is to the Irish in, in America. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, there's a um, there's a, a lot of, uh, as, as, as Chris Anderson suggested, there's a lot of this that, that, that seems uh, sometimes to be almost humorous. And it, 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 there can be a Keystone Cops uh, kind of um, yeah, uh, aspect to this where the the irish uh, fenians are constantly betrayed by someone or overestimate someone they've got the men but they don't have the arms they've got the arms but they don't have the men and and as you mentioned and you you cover it all in the book there's multiple incursions into canada it's not just this one but how much of this push to invade canada was a serious belief that it could change things in ireland and how much is kind of grand fundraising theater and too bad for the, the, the poor dimwits at the low end of the totem pole who believe in the cause and end up getting killed by it. Because I, I was really struck that smart people must have had some real doubts that this could really work. Yeah, so I mean, there's two things here. So one is on the fundraising side. So that Fenian Brotherhood that forms in 1858, again, original idea is to have the revolution in Ireland. Uh, when this idea of attacking Canada comes up, there's a split in the organization. So right around the corner from that Moffat Mansion headquarters I showed you, which is those people really want to, inside the Moffat Mansion, want to stay with the plan of the revolution in Ireland. Right around the corner on Broadway, the, the so-called men of actions, what they call themselves, open up a new headquarters, and then they're raking in the money hand over fist. So there is sort of then this, you know, battle between the two sides who can sort of launch their revolution first to get the most money coming in. But I do think that there is a lot of sincere belief that the invasion, when it happens, is going to eventually come their way. And it's not necessarily this idea among real hardcore Fenians that, all right, we're going to get into Canada. We're going to take it over. It's going to be a mere matter of marching. And then we're going to simply just ransom Canada for Ireland's independence. Uh, there's a there's a, another thought that what they'll do is they'll use Canada as a way to sort of divert troops from Ireland to Canada 
that will then make Ireland more readily conquerable by a revolution inside Ireland. But I think the idea that they're really going for that's the most plausible here is that spark some sort of war between the United States and Great Britain. And then in return for helping the United States conquer Canada, which the United States wants to have, that as part of the peace treaty that the that the uh, Americans will do the Irish a favor and demand that the British free Ireland and give it its independence. So that's probably the most plausible thought here in terms of what they're going to be able to do by getting troops over into Canada to sort of take advantage of that animosity that's there at the time uh, in Anglo-American relations and use it to their advantage. So Chris, one of the things that um, I would like to turn to now is kind of the, the other player in all of this. And Rick knows, and people who watch our show all the time know that I have a very strong interest, because some could say a bias towards Canada. Uh, but I think that yeah. very often Americans kind of just consider it, it's that place up north. And we know very little yeah. about the yeah. <laughs> we know very little about the history of the place and, and its development as a nation. Um, so I'd like to know kind of the impact of this constant state of tension, which you really talk about from before the Civil War up through the 1870s along the border. What does that mean for Canadians? And maybe if you could explain a little bit, as you do in some length in the book, which is fascinating, how these raids affect Canada's becoming a nation and what it does to people there and how it affects them. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sort of one of the grand ironies of the story is that the Fenians will be successful at liberating uh, an area of the British Commonwealth. It's just not the one that they intend to. I, I, I shouldn't say liber I shouldn't say liberate, but bring self government to uh, to uh, a, a part of the British Commonwealth. So, at the time that these the backdrop in Canada to the Fenian raids is that. There is this movement uh, among some in Canada who want confederation, basically have uh, Canada or Canada have its own federal parliament to have some degree of self-rule. And there's debates going on in Ontario and Quebec and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia in 1866 about whether to move ahead with this. And then once the Fenian raids, this, this constant talk about the defense of the border, and then when the Fenian raids occur, you know, it gives a lot of momentum to this confederation movement among Canadians who think, well, the British did really nothing to protect our borders. Um, you know, it was Canadian defense forces who end up having to be deployed here. You know, we've got a serious security issue here. The United States doesn't appear to be doing anything to try to quell it from happening again, because um, it's not just this incursion that happens at Ridgeway. Uh, there is a, another incursion that happens from Vermont into southern Quebec for a couple of days. It's not; it doesn't result in a battle, uh, but you had in this incursion to southern Quebec. Basically, the British have pulled their forces away from after hearing about what happened at Ridgeway. They pulled their defense forces 15 miles away from the border. So the Fenians were able to basically have free reign over this uh, area of, of farmland in southern Quebec. So it gives us momentum inside what become the provinces to then pass confederation. And it's going to happen that it passes July 1st, 1867 is the meeting of the first Canadian Parliament. And it's in Ottawa. And Ottawa is this backwater lumber town, but it's not, uh, the, the decision was not to place the capital in Montreal or Toronto because there were fears that the British, uh, that the Americans would invade it. So they needed a place far enough away from the border. And so that's why they cited the, um, they cited the parliament in Ottawa. Uh, and sort of, that's sort of the, out, uh, you know, the unintended outcome of the Fenian race. Chris, I, I was curious uh, about your uh, uh, own research here. Uh, there are there are several. Uh, you know, Ridgeway is the battlefield. There are several other. Uh, one could hesitate to call them battlefields, but battle sites. Uh, 
uh, uh, from the incident at uh, Mount Eccles, uh, Trout River. Um, did you do your own battlefield tour here? And uh, if you did and visit some of the places where action happened, what did you find anything that surprised you or that, that you thought really made that trip worthwhile? Well, I did, I did some, and then a lot of it was uh, the archival research on you know, the Canadian uh, archives and, and, uh, and the United States as well. Probably the best experience I had though was going to uh, in Echo, to where the Battle of Echo Hills happens in 1870. And this is right on the border between Vermont and Quebec. And we had, I had mentioned in 1866, after the Battle of Ridgeway, that there was this incursion from Southern Vermont in, from Northern Vermont into Southern Quebec. And it happened, um, the, the border crossing happened at the dairy farm of a man named Albert Richard. And in 1870, when John O'Neill decides he's going to attack again, he decides he's going to go down the same exact road and use Albert Richard's dairy farm once again, uh, much to Albert Richard's consternation that <laughs> he's just trying to keep his dairy farm afloat. And now he's got a geopolitical battle from 4,000 miles away coming you know, to his door again. <laughs> And when the battle happens, he's got John O'Neill hiding inside and the Canadian Defense Forces are shooting up, you know, his farmhouse. And even worse, he's upset that, you know, they're tracking mud all into his house and getting his <laughs> grandmother's quilt all, all dirty. Um, but that farmhouse still stands and it's still in possession of the same family. So mm -hmm. I was able to visit there and they have artifacts that they had recovered from the battlefield. You know, so you had, you know, some rifles that were thrown, thrown away as the Athenians fled from the battlefield, which was a giant fiasco um, of a battle for them. Uh, there are even, you know, some pieces of, of the uniform that were there. And uh, so that, that was very interesting to be able to see, you know, at least Obviously, the landscape along the border has tremendously changed from, from what it was at, at that time, but at least you could still see somewhat the layout of the land, the farmhouse is still there, and to actually, you know, sort of hold in your hands the artifacts mm. from what happened there in 1870 and, you know, sort of hold the same weapons that were uh, used was, was something that was definitely uh, probably one of the highlights of the research that I got to do for it. So... Oh, go ahead, Rick. No, I, if you kind of squeeze one in, Chris, go ahead. Okay, squeeze in one. Else. I want to say that we've only just really scratched the surface of this, and you've, you've got to read this book if you want to understand. Um, it's a very compelling story. It's very complex. There's a lot to it. And one of the things that will strike you um, are the ripples of these events on history today. And that kind of leads to the, the question I'd like to sort of finish up with is, you know, how is this how is this uh, story and how are these characters remembered in Ireland today? Do, do Irish people, are they aware of it? And if so, are these kind of part of the pantheon of Irish heroes or where does this sit in their, in their story? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not really very well remembered there any differently than it is in the United States. Uh, Canada is probably the place where it's remembered the best because it's sort of one of these seminal moments leading up to confederation. Um, but I think, you know, even though there are a lot of farcical aspects to the story, I think the thing that's sort of their legacy is that there was this, uh, a lot of their uh, Fenians came out of the Young Ireland Rebellion in 1848, and they were able to keep this uh, torch of independence and freedom alive to pass along to the next generation, which turned out to be the Easter Rising generation in 1916. And that transatlantic network that was established with the plan to have in america the irish who immigrated here to raise money and weapons that they would send back to ireland to launch a revolution is in place in 1916 when the easter rising occurs so that when the irish proclamation is read outside the gpo in dublin you know there's a reference very high up to the support of ireland's exiled children in america and the critical role that they play there so even though the fenians were you know far from successful in terms of what they wanted to do they didn't let that spirit of independence wither from 1848 they kept it alive so that it was still there 
until 1916 for at least in Irish America to be able to lend that support, critical support back to Ireland for what is, you know, the Easter Rising, hopefully not successful either, but sort of that seminal moment that leads to the eventual revolution in the years after that. So, Chris Klein, thank you so much for joining thank us you, today. And as Chris Anderson said, we've just scratched the surface of this terrific book, When the Irish Invaded Canada. Check it out. And Chris, thanks for joining us and uh, stay well. Thanks, thanks so much, guys. Chris. Appreciate it. Great to talk to you. You All too. Right, cheers. Thank you. Well, that was a, a terrific interview. I really enjoyed uh, learning more about the multiple nefarious Just how crazy Irish that idea that was. incursions on Canada. So that was a really enjoyable show, and I'm uh, glad we were able to present it again. And Chris, we, we are going to have another Encore episode next week on New Year's Day. Yes. What's that going to be about? Yeah, uh, we're going to have um, Richard Overy back to talk about his book, Blood and Ruins, which is a new and really um, revealing history of uh, World War II. Uh, that's gotten an awful lot of uh, interest and coverage over here in Great Britain. So Yeah, there's a tremendous, uh, I, I read a lot about it. It's showing up on a lot of lists. Yeah. Uh, he's a very thoughtful guy. That was a, a really kind of deep interview and uh, and uh, <laughs> deep for me. And, um, um, you know, I think you'll, you'll like that when it comes back. So check that out on New Year's Day. Absolutely. And a reminder, you can find all of our archived programs and more at our website, historyhappyhour.com. You can listen to episodes on the History Hour. History. Yeah. Happy Hour. How long have I been doing this? It's half a uh, lifetime. Roll it, roll it off your. The History Happy Hour, Happy Hour. podcast stream. Yes. Available on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and elsewhere. Keep living. Uh, keep a, learning. Hey. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Be safe.